thank you everyone for coming today and braving the awful weather outside. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance because I'm recovering from a cold, so I'm a little bit off, but I'm sure I'll still power through it and we will learn a lot today. So I'm going to talk today about the program. Actually, you know what? No, I'm recording. I'm sorry. <laughs> I will be talking today about the program Scalar, which is an uh, online program for building websites built specifically for digital publishing. And here in the Iris Center, we can help you set up your Scalar uh, website if you are interested. If you want to publish, say, your essay online, if you want to do your senior project on the internet, if you, you know, just want to examine a particular novel, or if you're a professor, you want to involve it into your classes, we can help you with that. So anyone who has a computer handy, I, you can get to the PowerPoint via this URL, via my personal site, benostermeyer.com slash scalar hyphen talk. Get in there, Connie. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has it, and that's fine. Um, <clears throat> but you can always go back later if you want, and we are recording, so you can watch this later, too, if you would like. All right, so real quick, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, how Scalar got started and what it was created to do. So it was made uh, by the Alliance for Networking Visual Culture, which is a group based primarily out of the University of Southern California, but I do think they have some um, people involved from other universities as well. Um, it was made primarily, or not primarily, it was made to be a user-friendly platform for digital publishing uh, of digital scholarship. And it allows for embedding for a wide variety of media formats, so photos, videos, audio, all sorts of stuff that can be drawn from other websites, or you can upload it yourself. Primarily, I recommend uploading it yourself. Um, I think the reason they do that is they have their own Scalar instance where they host the media, um, but that to reduce, reduce the server space on their server, they prefer if people drop from other websites. But for Iris, you can upload it just fine. Our server is plenty big, and we're not serving as many people as they are. Um, and a big uh, draw or feature of Scalar is that you can structure the arguments that you make with it in a nonlinear or multimodal formats. You don't have to. You can make it totally linear, but What's nice is it allows for the restructuring of arguments. And one other philosophy guiding Scalar is the idea that anything can annotate anything else. So the idea that you could have a page describing a photo or a photo perhaps even describing a page of written content. So this allows for a lot of cross-pollination between the features. Hi, Carol. You're welcome to come in. <laughs> There's a chair right up there. Yes. One quick question. Sure. Does the recipient also have to have Scalar uploaded? Or can it, can it go through email or whatever? Uh, anyone. So when you create a Scalar website, you, it'll you know create just a website that you can access wherever, so from, just from the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Website. It basically just creates a website for you. So real quick here, I have this quote from the Alliance for Networking Visual Culture's mission statement. Um, primarily about the alliance as a whole, their goals, but Scalar definitely fits into this philosophy. <laughs> So the Alliance aims to close the gap between carefully created digital visual archives and scholarly publication by enabling scholars to work more organically with archival materials, creating interpretive pathways through the materials and enabling new forms of analysis. So that's essentially what they're trying to do with Scalar, is allow for more cross-pollination between digital archives and um, written forms of analysis. Yes, Corey? Could you repeat the name of the Alliance? The yes. Alliance or what? The Alliance for Networking Visual Culture. Uh, no problem. Well, one, one additional thing: Are we going to have access to this PowerPoint so we can uh, to, to take all the? We can't get it all by, by handwriting. <laughs> yeah. No. Totally. Yeah. Okay. You, this will be up in perpetuity, and we'll have it on the Irish okay. Center website. Right. At the end, I can show you how to get to all of our previous talks. Okay. So, real quick, I'm not going to dwell a whole lot on this, but I'm going to show you the basic process for starting a Scalar website. I'm not going to get into all the fancier features. But I just wanted you guys to get a taste of what creating a Scalar website looks like. So here's what will happen whenever you first create a site, is you basically <laughs> get like this blank thing, this page contains no content. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start pulling over content from what was my senior project website about William Boleyn Whiteside. 
and he is actually someone who is buried on campus. If you go to Whiteside at SOEDU, you can learn all about him. Whole other story. If you've, if you ever had a conversation with me, I've probably bought him up once or twice. <laughs> probably, it's probably kind of annoying, so and I'm you sorry. you've seen the website, too, if you've ever had a conversation with him. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but in any case, I did not know about Scalar when I made this website, but this is actually, I'm not going to get into too much detail about this, but this website was structured to be nonlinear, like how you can do with Scalar. So if I had known about Scalar at the time, I might have built it, built my website with Scalar, but I did not. But in any case, I'm going to just demonstrate how you can start building a website. Is that, is that, is your Whiteside website available? Yeah, Whiteside, okay. Yeah, whiteside.saue.edu. It's also featured on the IRIS page. At the bottom yes, of yeah, at the end I'll show off our IRIS website. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what you can do is you can hit the plus, sorry, pencil button. Oh, I'm not logged in. I was logged in earlier, but. Foundation of any tool. Yes. <laughs> All right, so you'll get this nice little editor. So I have this Word document up already. This is a shortened version of the intro page of my website. One kind of frustrating thing about Scalar is sometimes when you copy and paste content, it can get a little bit messy, and I didn't want to deal with mess today. Clunky. Yes, clunky is a good clunky. word for it. Um, and the way that I'd written my Word documents for my website was kind of fancy, and so I had to do some cleanup first. But in any case, I'm copying and pasting. Notice how I have footnotes here. And then here we go. It automatically put the footnotes in. And Great then, feature. Yep, <laughs> exactly. So Scalar does do some things really nicely. I'm going to get rid of this title here because we've got it up here. And then I'm just going to hit Save and View. And here we go. Um, so next I'm going to add a picture. And actually, I'll show you what this page looks like on my actual site. So same content up to here pretty sure, or something like that. Um, in any case, I'm going to add this little picture here, but I've got that downloaded already onto my desktop. Um, so there it is. So to add media, you go to this little arrow down pointing at this little box shape. This is where you can draw in media from other websites, but what I'm just going to do is go to Files and URLs, Upload media files. Title, so, oh, I was practicing it earlier, so it already has the field for me. Grave of William Bowen Whiteside. Description, this is where you can put a caption. You can see it already is suggesting it for me as well, but I'm just going to take it from here. Um, choose a file. Here we go. So this is like the media page for it. But now I go back to the page, the introduction, hit the pencil again to edit. And then I'm just going to put it in right here. So I'm just going to click here, put this little link here for insert inline scalar media link. And then I just selected the media from the list. And then lastly, I choose how big I want it to be. I'll make it medium. Um, I'm going to have it wrap around the text, and I'm going to put it on the right. And I do want to have the caption. Now, when in the editor, it doesn't look like how it'll look once you save it. And see, here's the fun part about Scalar. It does weird stuff like this. <laughs> and I don't really have time. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on figuring out why it's doing that. It's, but it's it, responsive. It's right. the sad reality of web editing. It's exactly. not all like beautiful immediately. Right. It does involve but if you're, yeah. if you're doing your own scalar site and you're dealing with stuff like this, we're here to help you. <laughs> so, um, don't, don't give up. Yes, <laughs> don't just give up. Um, but in any case, at least we've got a photo and some text. So the last thing I want to do is just to create another page. Um, and this is my arrival ideology page, which is one, another page from my website. Just going to copy and paste it. That's 
yeah. I could, if you have questions about that sort of thing, I can talk a bit about it afterwards. Idea. Yes, I spelled that right. Okay. Okay, so now we've got two pages going on. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to that intro page, hit the plus button, or sorry, the pencil button. The plus button is how you add a new page. Pencil button is how you link them. Go to relationships, path, and then to make this page a path, so the path is like the term for how Scalar puts things together. So I'm going to choose the items that it contains, so it actually contains itself and arrival ideology. And then the last thing you can do is when reaches reach the end of the path, you can have it go back to the intro if you would like. And now all of a sudden the text is fixed. <laughs> in any case, now you can go here and see what's in this path. And I can click begin with arrival ideology. And here we go. And now we're at the end of the path, so we can go back to the intro. So that's the very basics it's of... It's kind of dominating a linear reading, though, because you get to that menu at the end of one page, and then you can go on to the next page. Right. Well, there's ways to make it nonlinear, and I'm going to show you some examples of people that have made it nonlinear. I just didn't want to... That gets a little bit complicated, so right. getting, the, getting involved with that in the demo okay. would be a bit much. Okay, so... Take a drink real quick. Here I've got three examples. The first one was actually created by some students at SIUE, uh, including Gabby Borders, who um, was one of our DH miners. And for this website, they um, sorry, they decided to f they analyzed three different feminist texts. And I really like this line that they had here about the idea behind the structure of their website, which is, there is no set path for looking through this project. No piece of information takes priority over the other. We have created pages that are individual yet collaborative, making for a design that exhibits how intersectionality operates. So essentially, they use the, um, the, the structure of the um, topic to inform the structure of their argument. So, again, they have the path here, which has the three texts and then a page about intersectionality. I love that one. Yes. <laughs> so, let's go to the page for her land. And has a brief synopsis. Um, and then they d talk about some themes in the book. And I'll go, so the intersectionality page is where some of the nonlinearity shows up. So here they actually scan specific parts of each of the texts on the book scanner in Iris mm -hmm. and um, they group them together by theme and you can actually go to each theme so let's say education and you can see some discussion of education and also um, the different sections in each of the texts that relate to that theme. They did this for Tech and Lit, right, Jessica? Yeah. Yeah, that's one of our courses, or one of the minor, DH minor courses. So they made it in three months. They made it in about a month, actually. Yeah, that was like their, their <laughs> final project. Their yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the next uh, is Prudence Person's Scrapbook, um, which has been loading a bit slowly today, because this one's on the Scalar server. <laughs> Thankfully, our Iris server doesn't have as much of a problem with that. So this is a, this is a digital um, edition of a 19th century um, scrapbook made by Prudence Person. And it, the scrapbook has um, a variety of different things, poetry, um, let me see. There was, view it thematically, we'll give, remind me of what's in here, sorry. Flowers, obituaries, religion, a lot of different clippings. Um, and what's neat is they have two, again, two different modes of reading the text. You can view it linear, linearly, um, just how the original text was structured, so from beginning to end. Whoops, I clicked.
clicked the wrong one. Okay. Um, the author, the, or the, the professor that worked on this, Ashley Reed, um, at the time was at Chapel Hill. Now she's at Virginia Tech. But she wrote an article about this that's in the Teaching with Digital Humanities collection that I edited. Yeah. I was about to mention that. Oh, thanks, <laughs> she has a whole <laughs> chapter about the process of making this website and so many of the challenges that she faced in doing it because she started off doing it in an undergraduate class and had some struggles. But it was a good lesson in how to incorporate uh, DH into your pedagogy, which is what this entire book is about, <laughs> edited by Jessica Despain <laughs> and uh, Jennifer Travis. So. We have several copies of that in here. We do. They're over there on the, can you check them out? Super. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> um, so here's the, here's the linear path, and then here's the thematic path. I recommend, you know, afterwards, when you get to the uh, PowerPoint, to check these out um, afterwards as well. This last one is not uh, multilinear. Or... Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Are there photos in the printed first thing? Yes, yeah, sorry, I should have shown you that. So um, let's just go to illustration. And what year was the scrapbook dated? I don't remember. Is it pre-1924? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, it's 1860s. Okay, so public domain. Oh yeah, and this was in um, it was in an archive, and I think it was already digitized when they had it for the class. Loading media, but this is the picture. <laughs> that brings up a good point, though. You know, digital domain and, and copyright issues mm -hmm. when you're. I mean, if you're dealing with old text, that's okay, but right. Um, it's still a good copyright, and Scalar doesn't. Kind of looks the other way for that because it's not, it's not like a very public. Right, they're very hand like the 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 creators of Scalar are certainly very hands off on what other people put on their site. A lot of tools are like that though. It's really ultimately the role of the instructor or the mentor to mm -hmm. guide students through those that right. really tricky minefield of yeah, don't copyright and ownership. Don't start stuff. putting Disney movies on Scalar. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> or try. Let's see what happens. <laughs> does that menu bar only appear, how, when or how does that menu bar appear on the left there? This one? Yeah. Um, so this was, uh, I think they're just using a different scalar theme than what I was using on the Whiteside site. Mm -hmm. There's different ways to um, but it, I noticed, adjust that. Uh, when, on it's another page that. it wasn't there. No, it, it's part of that project. And that's how they set it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sort of their banner. And so it appears on all pages. I think so. What's also interesting about this is they have, uh, they're using Scalar's uh, image annotation, mm -hmm. where you can, it actually has like squares drawn around uh, nice. the different um, clippings. Mm -hmm. So Scalar has really nice image annotation. So this last example, um, this was Edward Sermon, who came to the uh, Iris Center Conference last year. Uh, and he, he actually gave a workshop on Scalar at that. And he actually, he, uh, I can't remember, but he was from a university in California. And he uh, published his dissertation on Scalar. He Berkeley. Yeah. He was Berkeley. Yeah, He's yeah, we figured that out last week and then I forgot. Berkeley's got a huge. Yeah. If I didn't have a cold, <laughs> I might have remembered. But um, so <clears throat> his, like, he essentially took his dissertation, divided it into the different sections, and then you know you can go to whichever section. It's not multilinear, but um, it's you know it's a way of publish publicizing his work. And I don't know if he included much digital media in this, but that's okay. What are the religions? Uh, <laughs> Islam, I, Judaism. And, oh, really? Yeah. I thought it was Mormon. No, it's monotheism. Yeah. Well, so those are the examples, and there's many more. If you're interested, I might be able to find some for you. So I'm going to talk a bit about, compare, I'm going to compare Scalar to some of the other platforms that we use often in the Irish Center. So Omeka, some of you may well be familiar with, um, is one we use a lot, probably more. And we have video workshops of Omeka. Yes, we've done many workshops of Omeka in the past. And I am even more familiar with Omeka than Scalar. 
Uh, so some things that Scalar is better at than Omeka is that you can um, build a nonlinear argument on the site. Much it's much easier to do that with Omeka. Sorry, with Scalar than with Omeka. Um, but you can still draw in the archival materials that Omeka might have, and you can actually draw in materials from an Omeka site into a Scalar site. Um, okay, wait a second. So, yeah, that was confusing. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so what is better at a nonlinear? Scalar? Or scalar is be yeah, any scalar is better at building a nonlinear argument. So can you use the Omeka archive with a scalar mm -hmm. front? Yes. Awesome. Yes, that is something you can do. Yeah. It's kind of like oh scalar's kind of like the exhibit builder for yes, Omeka. But better at it. Yes, I would say. Right. So it kind of tries to do what the exhibit builder does, but offers a lot more features. Except that it does seem to force linearity still in the way it's structured, unless you could use a menu bar. There, there are ways to make it less linear, but um, it is also, it is um, also good for much better at image annotation, like I showed you with the example. Um, it is not as good at building a digital archive as Omeka, which makes sense. That's what Omeka is for, and I find it much easier. Maybe it's just because I have a lot more experience with Omeka, but I find it much easier to um, adjust the appearance with Omeka, since Omeka is Omeka is much better built from the back end, in my experience. Is Omeka free and available through Iris? Yes. Mm -hmm. Both both WordPress and Omeka, the other two examples I'm using, those are also available to anyone who wants to use it. About using different types of scripts, different languages, mm -hmm. using Chinese to do it. Mm -hmm. I know Omeka is definitely built to do that sort of thing. I'm not so oh. sure how well Scalar is. It might be, but I, I can't say that for sure. So import ASCII. Yeah. And then uh, WordPress, which is in some ways similar to Scalar in some ways, but Scalar is built specifically for making scholarly arguments. Um, it was made for scholars by scholars. So because of that, if you're doing anything scholarly with digital publishing, Scalar might make more sense. And it offers a little, since it's built specifically for that, it's easier to structure an argument into it. OK, so I'm I'm sorry, I'm very ADD. ADHD. It's okay. So the way this is set up, compared to WordPress, better at. Yeah, sorry, I didn't structure this. Scalar is better at. Yes, this is things that Scalar is better at. And then on the other side, those are things that Scalar is worse at compared to WordPress. Okay. Yeah, sorry if that was confusing. Um, but WordPress, because WordPress has less of a specific feature, so you can do a, a much wider variety of things with it. And and WordPress is a WordPress also since it's much more widely used has a lot more resources online for using it. So I'd say the best thing Scalar is for is for a pedagogical tool. It's a great way to introduce um, to get started with digital rhetorical practices. So publishing your writing for the internet or for a you know a digital audience, and it's really good for small and mid-scale digital projects. But once you start in getting into large scale projects, it's not quite as robust as some other platforms. So here's some just some questions that I'm going to raise before we conclude and get into a question discussion session. Um, is that what what do we mean when we really say digital publishing? Because when when I think of publishing, you know, I, I often feel like publishing is not really the right word with digital uh, presentation because publishing it and this is not necessarily true for print publishing but it feels much more final when you printing but of course that's not really true but in any case um, when you're publishing digitally it's much less stable it's there's a lot more room for future change whereas if you're printing a book the book exists as is though of course there's future editions and multiple editions that exist and then Another thought is, what are reasons that you might want to construct a nonlinear argument in Scalar or any other website? And does it, are there reasons why you wouldn't want to? And then ultimately, the goals of Scalar to present multiple forms of analysis, did that actually happen? And what, if so, what are they? And what are ways that we can use Scalar to interact more engaged with our digital materials? So that's what I had prepared for today, but feel free to ask questions and 
לכמה? 